make sure your uh, situation is taken care of over there. Hello, hello, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Glad you're hanging out with us this fine evening. Uh, Joanna's out of breath because she, I, well, she did a very nice thing for me. I forgot, oh my gosh, I forgot my water and I realized it about 20 seconds ago. And so she decided that she was going to run upstairs and grab it for me. I made a break for her before I hit the go live button. And so here we are, here you are. Thanks for being here. Glad you're spending your time with us on this fine Wednesday. And if for some reason you're watching on the replay later, glad you're spending your time Whoa. with us, whatever time you're watching it, when it's the time that you're watching it at that time. You got that? Moving on. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> whatever. So <laughs> thanks for being here. Uh, we do not have a specific subject tonight. We are going to be spending most of our time, hopefully answering your questions. Hopefully you've got some that you want to bring to us today. Uh, we also have, I would say, a rather extensive giveaway tonight, too. Yes. Would you say? I have it yeah. right here. And we, I was like, what is it? And it's like, I'm like, that, 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 that. that, that, that. that. And I'm like, she's like, wait, all this? I'm what? like, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I feel like we might have missed a giveaway at some point. I think we probably uh, did. And I think we need to make up for it. And so the way we're going to make up for it is give away about twice as much as what we normally do. So how about that? How about That's that? That's the way we are going to roll with it this fine evening. So I don't know how it is by you, but by us, it has been snowing all day in the Chicagoland area. And I am really not happy about that whatsoever at all. It is way past any reasonable point for there to be snow. It's April. It's April, it's That's April right. in Chicagoland. No. I say, let it snow. Grass is green and the flowers are out and we need to move beyond it. Do you remember what I played on my phone for you this morning? Yeah, I didn't like that either. So not let it snow let it snow let it snow stupid by dean martin flipping snow so anyway <laughs> but you know what we're here and you're here and so that's going to make it all better uh let's see what we what is going on the oh my gosh we've got so much going on this week but as it relates to you let's see on sunday i did what did i do really popular fish for 2024 i think that was the video i did and i came up with a, a few a five or so of fish that I think are growing in popularity and are going to be even more popular uh, this year and for years to come. And by the way, before we get too far, thank you, Hunters, for becoming a new Prime Timer, Primate. Uh, glad you're here hanging out with us. So that was Sunday. And then Monday on the Tank Talk podcast, we had a little discussion about water changes. And I love doing those discussions in a much longer format because you are able to talk about more things and get into the the details a little bit more and so if you haven't checked that out on the tank talk podcast that's a different youtube channel that john from kg tropicals and i do check it out because that was a really great discussion uh let's see today what did you do today on the small scape well i talked about five did you watch it i watched a little part of it as i was trying oh, to was get a million say, trillion other things done because you didn't you didn't say anything afterwards so i know that you didn't see a specific spot but anyways five random things that i have gotten acquired come about in the last couple months that i was sharing and i i kind of said would you would you buy it use it want it throw it in the garbage would you want to throw it in the yeah. garbage yes you might want to throw it right in the garbage <laughs> so <laughs> that was that uh for my prime timers the video came out today instead of tomorrow because tomorrow john and i are going to be doing all kinds of recording for the podcast and I knew I was not going to have time for, to do it tomorrow so I wanted to get it out early and so you got it today we went over some details on this tank right over there the 125 nano tank and some things that are going on there how fun it is fun close uh, up and then let's see here what else do we have going on Sunday we'll have a video out for you of course on primetime aquatics because that's what we do on Sundays that's when the videos release and yeah you know I don't know if I ever really specifically mentioned that those of you who have been watching the channel for a long time I think have probably figured it out but the, the schedule generally runs on Mondays. We've got the podcast that comes out on the Tank Talk podcast. On Wednesdays, you have your video on the Smallscape. On Thursdays, we have the Primetimer video on Primetime Aquatics. And then on Sundays is the regular Primetime Aquatics video. And so that's the schedule that we have been doing over the last, I don't know how many years, but it's been a while. So in case you're ever wondering, like, when does this stuff come out? Is it random? No, it is not random. Uh, JP Prank, thank you so much for being a member the last five months. Really appreciate it. Glad you're hanging out with us. All right, so yeah, that's the that's the videos. And of course, the where we are going to be, there is a lot of places we're going to be 
over the next couple of weeks. And so, for instance, on Sunday, I mentioned this a few times, we have the Quad City swap in Davenport, Iowa, and we have the GCCA swap in Northbrook, Illinois. Website has already been updated. So for those of you who are looking to put in pre-orders, primetimeaquatics.com, all of that stuff is there. It's We've already sold out of Oh my gosh, like four or five fish already? Really? Yeah. What so was the first? Do you remember the first one that's held? I, I don't. I just remember I'd looking at the website and like sold out, sold out, sold out. Oh. So we've sold out of a number of stuff. So thank you for everybody who's already placed the pre-orders and have gotten lots of what I think will be really cool fish. So that is what's going on there. So again, primetimeaquatics.com. There's where the pre-orders are pre-ordered. Yeah, that was deep and profound. So yeah, a uh, local guy says, was so sad you sold out of the blue eyes. There's a chance we Aww. might have some that we bring to the swap because what i do with the quantities that you see on the website is that's a number that i feel like okay, this is safe because let's face it it's really hard when fish are all swimming around the tank and you're like all right well i know i'm supposed to have a couple hundred here but you never know what happens so sometimes they might short you a 15 or 20 or sometimes they you know a few might die and if you got bristle nose plecos in there you would never know it and so I always put in what I consider to be a safe quantity that I know we can fulfill. And then we try to bring a few straggler bags to the swap. If something says sold out, we try to bring a few more to the tables so that, you know, there, there's some there as well. But not a guarantee, but hopefully that will happen. So that's Sunday. And then on the 20th of April, we it's a Saturday, we will be in Tinley Park. And that is the Greenwater Aquarius Society swap. And then... The swaps at that point are very, very few and far between. In fact, we will not be at any swaps in May. There will be one in June that's a green water, nothing in July, and then one in August. So there will only be a couple more swaps that we will be at until next swap season in the fall. So get your fish now or forever hold your tank water. <laughs> you like that? I, I get it. All on my own. So Shocking. Yeah, I know. Uh, that, is, that is where we're going to be. Jim's got a great question. There is, uh, there's rare fish, but is there any more rare fish that we don't know about? Oh, I'm sure there is. I am sure there are rare fish that we don't know about, but here's the key. There are rare fish that are not really in the hobby that are rare because most people don't want them. And then there are rare fish because we really haven't discovered them in their natural environment and we haven't yet or and or we haven't yet figured out how to breed them sufficiently but they would be highly desirable if they were rare and then there are those rare fish that are actually potentially a line bred fish that'll happen at some point in the future or maybe some type of albino you know you, you think about things like the electric blue acara or you know, some of the albino strains are really cool so there are always the potential for those things to happen but Oh, I'm sh I am quite certain that there are fish out there in some remote lake somewhere, some part of the river. You know, I'm thinking especially like maybe a certain types of epistogramma. That would be one where it'd be right for like, oh my gosh, look at this. Or some new type of rasbora, some tetra that we just haven't run across yet. And it'll happen. A new type of man. You know, especially mm -hmm. some gobies. I could see gobies because they can t they tend to blend so well with their environment sometimes and they can be extremely shy when they want to be i could see us discovering so discovering some new gobies at some point cool yeah we can always use more gobies that's what i, I always say i i know that's you Especially say that almost tiny, every day like the lipstick gobies yeah that tiny. would be cool uh, Brooklyn says, would you ever get honey grommy? I need peaceful centerpiece. Oh, absolutely. We've had honey grommies in our fish room many, 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 many times. So uh, I really like the yellows. I, they, I like the orange, the standard honey grommy as well, but the yellows are really nice. Yeah, and they're pretty. They will most likely find a place in either the fish room or the fish gallery or up in your fish studio place uh, at some point. Somewhere, somehow, it, there's usually going to be honey grommies floating around. It, it, I'm surprised right now. I'm trying to think in all of the aquariums that we have. Usually we always have a standard grommy, a blue, a gold, an opaline. We put them in kind of with cichlids and they really fit in well, but we don't have one of those right now. We don't even have any sparkling grommies. That's no a crime. Sparkling. I don't believe we have any honey grommies. We have no dwarf grommies. What we do have are some pearl grommies in, one, in the catch-all 125. Sure. So they are there. That would be a good fish to probably get out of there. 
and find a forever home for them because right now we've got a couple tanks in our fish room on the fish room side that are catch-all tanks one of them is a 40 breeder and the other is a 125 and what that means is these are fish that basically they lost their home when we broke this area down or we moved fish around and they wind up in a tank where they're going to be fine they're healthy they're happy they're eating everything is fine but we just haven't found a, a habitat for them just yet that uh, we are really excited about so in five minutes everybody remind whip to turn off his water oh my gosh could that be a horrible thing if you forget like what is that beautiful relaxing sound is it raining outside no it's raining inside <laughs> that what is that bad. sound yeah i know i've walked that's, that's inside walked rain. in the house with uh, that sound yes yes that was a time the basement flooded because the uh one of the boys forgot to turn off the the water that goes so we have a switch yeah. and the on the sink and you kind of flip it and then it goes through the hose and into one of the tank fillers or if you turn it back it goes through the sink well you can turn that switch off here so it's going through the hose but then we have another thing on the part that hooks onto the tank that also closes and so the water pressure was building in this basically a python type hose which is not meant to hold full water pressure especially a hose that's a little bit on the older side and it split and we had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of water all throughout the basement. So some, thankfully we have two sumps in here. They were both running like crazy and it was a little bit of a, it was a little bit of a wreck. It was very stressful. And of course, you, you know, like some of you, we've had the occasional oops, uh, overflow a tank a little bit here and there. We've had a couple hang on back filters run out the back onto the floor, but that is why I'm a big proponent of not having tanks upstairs except for your studio there will be maybe a couple there mm -hmm. uh, and there was in the live stream uh the old live stream studio as well but they were small 8.3 gallon we really tried to keep the tanks upstairs to a minimum especially once we redid the floors and all that stuff because we try you never know things can happen things can go wrong so down here something goes wrong the electricity is off the floor and we have two sumps and it would be not good like it was when it happened but it's also we, we can deal with it. That's why you have nano tanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have nano tanks. I know. That's why you, you should have yeah. you like one so, and all. So Logan mm -hmm. says, absolutely love the channel. Thank you so much. I started the hobby about two months ago and I'm in love with it all. Your videos have been so educational and helpful. Well, thank you very much. Glad you're here. Uh, it can be at first. It just seems like there is this endless amount of information, but really once you key in on a few really important details, the hobby is very, very enjoyable and often, I wouldn't say problem free, but you certainly minimize problems. And that is one, having patience. Two, making sure you understand water parameters and, and making sure that your tanks are cycled properly before you throw fish in there. And then quarantine is a big one for us that we talk about all the time. But when you figure those things out, the rest of it kind of falls into place and it's not as overwhelming as it might seem at first. Mm. Oh, I got a couple good ones here. Sure. Uh, MJ2, me too, something like that. Uh, did your boys ever smash any of your tanks? I am debating the merits of tempered glass given my offspring. <laughs> That's funny. That's a good question. That's I, a good question. No, they have never smashed, broken, done anything. And we had them down in the fish room when they were very young. I mean, I told this story yeah. a couple weeks ago, but I can remember when we had, there's a window right over here and it's just outside of the view of the camera but in the old days we used to drain the tanks out that basement window and into the backyard oh my gosh the grass absolutely loved that in the summertime but we had to crack that window open i can remember like when eli was small he would want to help and he'd have to put gloves on because he's like his hands little hands are like my hands are cold i'm like well do you want to stop or do you want to get gloves he's like oh i just want gloves and so he would stand there and hold that hose because it would be a little bit of a breeze coming through there <laughs> and uh but yeah they were down here from a very very young age i mean eli is 16 now so it's hard to believe he's he's got 12 years of experience under his belt maintaining aquariums and luke has well he's got that much at least as well because he was down here when he was about seven so uh because he's three years older See how I did all that math in my brain? Good job. I know. So, um, the te yeah, the tempered glass thing, that can help. But it's I did a video on if your children ever ask for a fish tank, like one of the things that you should do. But it, it really comes down to anything else where you 
teach them the appropriate way to behave around an aquarium. Don't pound on the glass. Don't lean on the tank because sometimes things can be unstable. Don't put anything in the water. That could be dangerous. Don't play with electricity. And just obviously when a child is in a room where there is an aquarium, you want to make sure that you are not leaving them alone, just like you wouldn't leave a child alone with a dog that's never been around a dog before. Because next thing you know, the child's pulling on the dog's ear, the tail, the dog decides, I'm done with this. And now the child's crying, hey, it bit me. And maybe it didn't actually bite, bite the kid. But same thing with the fish tank. I would just watch the little ones until they are, uh, you know, you're comfortable with what they're doing. Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate it. Best hang on back filter recommendation for 90 gallon. My two Oase hang on backs get clogged so quickly. Yeah, um, 90. So you've got a taller aquarium, so you're going to need a pretty decent size intake for that. And I, I personally, again, it's a four foot tank, so I'm a big fan, especially with a tank that tall. I really like the idea of having two hang on back filters on a four foot tank just to maximize water flow and maximize mechanical filtration. One filter is plenty strong enough for all the biological filtration, but I really like that extra mechanical and having them on both sides. So that being said, you could be looking at a couple of different filters. Uh, you could easily go with the Seachem Tidal 75. I think that would be a good one. It would still fit over the rim of the tank because the 90 and the 75 are basically the same tank. The 90 is just a little bit taller. So you could go with the Seachem Tidal 75s. You could go with the Marineland Pro 375s. And of course, you've got the AquaClear 70s. Uh, the reason why I always recommend the Seachems and the Marineland Pros is I like the fact that they have those internal impellers, internal motors. It keeps the noise down. It allows them to be uh, self-priming, which means if you lose power or anything, the water is not going to drain out of the intake tube and then have a hard time restarting. Those filters just restart right away. You don't need to fill the backs of them. And I like them both. So uh, those are usually my go-tos when I recommend filters. Seachem, Tidal, like I said, for this tank, 75s, Marineland Pro, 375s would both be good. What you got? You look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I got a couple things. First oh, of all, um, Oink got uh, poison ivy. Well, I that's am not so good. sorry. I bet that's itchy. I'm so yep. sorry. That's not good at all. And yep. yes, we had a great Easter. I hope you did as well. Yep. World's best moderator. If he Oink. says, kids in aquariums, you know how doctor's offices often have one in the waiting room. Yes, kids will press their faces against the glass and pass around pink eye. No kidding. I oh. can only imagine. Yeah. Could you imagine? Like wow. A little, yeah, I never thought of it. Like yes. A, like the front of the glass would just be this yes. giant Petri dish of I mean, awesomeness. Finding Nebo, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. I, I never thought oh, about that wow. either, but oh my gosh. There was a question I don't Hold remember. On. Oh, you uh, want Brent says, can water changes in temps above 87 alone clear ick? Yes. The issue is how many fish can actually handle that. So a lot of the fish that we normally have, tropical fish, they start to really, really struggle. And so if they've already got a pretty serious case of ick, the reason why in my ick video, I, ad I usually advocate three things, and that is increasing the water temperatures, salt if you if you've got inhabitants that can take the salt, including the, you know, if there's plants in there, and then the ick meds like ick X. Could you run that temperature up to 87? Yeah, in the ick video that I did, we talked about how it basically, it, that it can't survive those high temps. The issue is if your fish are already heavily infected, then those extraordinarily high temperatures for most tropical fish are gonna be a, a, a tremendous stressor, more so than if you had the temperatures, let's say at like 83, 84, and then you were using something like ICX to deal with the, the, uh, the parasites that are free swimming. So that's why I usually advocate the meds and a slightly lower temperature just to try to reduce some of that. Not only that, but when you really get those temperatures cooking like you know the 87, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the tank is drastically decreasing as you increase those temperatures. So whether even if you're at 84, 83, 84, or 87, you're going to want to increase the flow, whether that is uh, extra air stones just to have more surface agitation, a wave maker provided that you don't have fish with long flowy fins, but you just want to make sure that you keep that, that water circulating so that they have the maximum amount of gas exchange at the top of the tank. Spencer is looking for a schooling fish that stands out that can go with a bed up. What size tank? What size tank, Spencer? Yeah, if we know what size tank, we can certainly 
talk about that. Leo, thank you so much for the super chat. Getting my five gold ocelotus tomorrow. They will be going into a 40 breeder with African cichlid sand. My question is how should I set up the shells and rocks? Great question. Going to be an awesome tank. Great size tank for that fish. The gold ocelotus are one of the more aggressive shell dwellers. Not that they're unmanageable. They are very manageable, but they are definitely not going to be similar to like your Maltese or the Similis or the Brevis, which tend to tolerate one another a lot easier. And you get a lot more breeding from those fish. So the, the 40 gallon breeder is going to be great. What I would do if I were setting up that tank is my rock work would probably be mostly in the middle. And then I would have shells all around the perimeter. And what that's going to allow you to do is the males that are in that tank, it's almost like they're going to have the four corners of the aquarium. And so if they're not as visible to one another, you're going to have a lot less aggression. And it's a nice footprint. You've done a good job picking out the aquarium for that type of fish. Lots of shells. I mean, if you've got five shell, if you've got five gold ocelotus, you could easily start out with 30, 40 shells. Let them figure it out. They'll move them around. They'll bury them. They'll bury each other's shells as well. And as the populations increase, although you're going to have a little bit more of a challenge getting that communal sort of aquarium like you see with the Maltes and the Simlis, just because the rival pairs will sometimes pick off one another's fry. So if you really want to breed them, as you start to get those juveniles, I would try to get them out of the tank if you're if you're looking to, to breed. But let them go as, as far as they can. And then once you notice that, hey, my numbers aren't increasing as you start to see fry, that's when I would probably start getting them out. But great, yeah, shells all around, most of your rock work in the middle. What you got? 40 gallon. 40 gallon for the betta, and mm -hmm. we want some... Um, School. Schooling fish. Okay, so we've got options with a 40 gallon. We're trying to stay away from fin nippers, so pretty much... That would include most of your barbs that have a tendency, and even a lot of your tetras, uh, a lot of your medium to larger tetras would probably not be a good idea. Plus, they're way too active, but I would never get a chance to eat with some of your more crazy fish. So I've got two ideas. I'll let you go ahead and start because you look like you got something you want to say about it. Green neons would be amazing because they have a beautiful color, basically three colors between green, blue, and purple in one single fish. That's right. And... You could have a really nice school in a 40. What? Uh, also, I would think a, a big school of embers would be pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing that with the green neons or the embers, keep them well fed. That is the key because I know there are some of you here who are like, oh my gosh, I tried a betta with you know, a certain type of neon or a certain type of tetra and it got fin nipped. And what we have found is as long as your fish are well, not overfed, but we feed all of our fish smaller meals twice a day. It keeps their belly kind of full, keeps them it makes it less likely that they're going to go after other fish and certainly after fins. I was thinking the Galaxy Rasbora, otherwise known as the Celestial Pearl Daniel or the Emerald Dwarf Rasbora. So not quite so crazy. And the green neons are not crazy. The ember tetras are not crazy. So those were two very solid, solid suggestions. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, um, and then on top of that, like I said, the galaxies and the Emerald Dwarf Rasbora, and I'm trying to think of what else. Lamp eyes might be pretty. Lamp eye Rasbora would be a very good one as well. I wonder how the Rummy Nose Rasbora would do in a tank like that. Possibly fairly well, I would think, because they're pretty chilled mm, out. Yeah. They're pretty chilled out fish. So Maybe. Those are all mm -hmm. potential options. Of course, you've got your Cory Cats at the, on the bottom. You could do Cooley Loaches. You've got your bristlenose plecos and even otos, otosynclus, depending on your water parameters, would be really nice for algae control, right? Charles wants to know, did you have stranger danger when I first came in with my new hair? I did. Yeah, I had stranger like, danger. You know, I was curious like, if he noticed. Oh like, gosh. And you did. Well, sometimes, yeah. you know, if it's Well, it's not new anymore because now it's been like a month and a right. half. But, but I mean, yeah, when, when it was. first happened, I was like, what? Who's this lady? Get out of I my said, house. I'm married. It's me. Uh, it's I was like, me. Leave anyway, I, I have to confirm. Give me a DNA sample. <laughs> Boink, thank you for being a member the last 30 months. I'm so glad you're here. She's the best. My guppies only have something that resembles ick with torn fins. Anyone else? Everyone else seems fine. 78 degrees. Parameter's good. Is there any guppy specific issues? So torn. I wonder if there's, is there guppies only? Everyone else seems fine. Is there fish? I mean, when you observe the tank are there fish in there that are kind of beating on them a little bit yeah who else is in there you know temperatures are good you know I'm, you know water parameters as well as anybody else so i believe you when you say that uh, i would say if if you've got so sometimes what happens is when fins get damaged 
especially if it's just on the fins, it can you'll see like white, white bumps. That's not ick. That is usually just damage to the fin. It could be the beginning of a bacterial infection. But I've had fish where their fins get damaged and they'll get those like a, a white bump on their fin and it never goes away and those fish live for years. Now, if you've got a bunch of them like that, that might be a different story. And so now I'm probably looking at uh, a possibility of a bacterial infection. Nice thing is, I don't know what else you got in the tank, but guppies can handle salt. I mean, so you could you can salt them to probably one tablespoon, easily one tablespoon per five gallons. Now, if you've got a bunch of plants in there, you've got bristlenose, you've got quarries or anything like that, they won't like that. But if you've got some other hard water fish or, that's, or you've got fish in there that can be removed, you can salt those bad boys to easily one tablespoon per five gallons. And then if it's not getting any better, then you could start looking at possibly medicating the tank. And yeah, go, I would go that direction, but possibly salt first, keep an eye on it. What you got? You got some? Yeah. Hi, Cheryl. And Steel Waves. And uh, of course, Oink. Regina. Yep. I'm calling all my green hearts, man, okay. for the green neon love. Uh, Emil says, how long until a new fish stops hiding and what t and to what point should you be worried? It's an angel fish and only other inhabitant is a bristlenose pleco, cherry barb, and oblivion rams and a 40 breeder. Great question. D it depends on the individual fish and the setup itself. So there's a number of reasons why fish will hide. I think I did a video on it a number of years ago, a few years ago, why fish hide. I think that's the title of the video. So I go into it in much greater detail if you want to check that out at some point. But in a tank like that, the only fish that would exercise any type of territorial behavior in a mid to upper water would be the Bolivian ram. So I would, I would just observe and make sure the Bolivian ram is leaving the angel fish alone. If the angelfish is particularly small, then they will they, they tend to hide a little bit more. Although newer angelfish, especially smaller ones, they should be pretty aggressive eaters, right? So normally when you bring angelfish at home and they're about the size of a quarter or a 50 cent piece, they usually love to eat. And so I would be looking at that if they're not eating in addition to hiding. Uh, to answer your question, it can take days and days. I've had fish that we bring in. I've had fish that we bring in and they never stop hiding. Uh, I've had fish. So for instance, and the, the 125 back here, for those of you who remember when we've set that tank up, there are five clown loaches in that tank and three of them are very large. They're about seven or eight inches at this point. They're big. I have not seen those fish come out. The only time I've seen them and that is, I don't know how long that tank has been set up now. It's been a few months. They still will not come out. They were in the 150. They had never, I shouldn't say never. They were only caught with a net one time. They were very small. They got very comfortable in their surroundings. And then when we had to catch them, that traumatized those fish. And so now the three big clown loaches refuse, even around feeding time, they will not come out from behind the wood over there. And I have put in, you know, I've done all the things. So the lights are generally pretty low. They have a lot of dither fish, so all the other fish are out. Two of the smaller clown loaches, they will come out around feeding time. And so what I've done is to make them feel comfortable, I put some little, little pellets along the back and the, the, the return kind of blows them back there. So I know they're eating, I know they're healthy. I can see them, like if you really peek back there, you can see them peeking out in the logs in the wood, but they will not come out. Now, when I have seen them out is when I come down here and there's a light right here that I'll flip on. And if I come down here right at the right time, like in the middle of the night, those big guys are right out there at the front of the glass. So it's a it's something where they got startled and their little tiny brains are remembering that. I'm not saying that that's going to happen to your angelfish, that it's never going to come out, but basically it can take days, if not a week or more. Uh, fish can go, uh, uh, at least a healthy fish can often go at least a week without eating. I mean, some of that is fish dependent. If it's still hiding, and especially if it's not eating, sometimes when fish are sick, then they're going to hide. So that's something that to, just to keep an eye on, make sure there's no obvious signs of disease. Uh, sometimes it takes other fish to bring them out, like some of the dither fish. And so if you have some, uh, I don't know, smaller, like neon sized tetras or something like that, that can help a lot as well. What you got? Yeah, you. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, I had it, but I lost it. Oh, um, 
Lumpy Dog wants to know, why are turquoise rainbow fish so amazing, but yet so underrated? That's a great question because they're an amazing fish. Yep, and we've got some, again, back in that tank right there with the clown loaches. We have some turquoise rainbows there. Yeah, they're uh, stunning. I would say, at least around here, they're not underrated because we bring them in frequently. And so I usually rotate the types of larger rainbow fish I bring in. I'll, I'll, use, I'll sometimes bring in the reds, the turquoise, the bosmani. Then I have like some of the lesser known, like the kurumoi, the mekalochai, um, the Al and I I've brought in and so I'll kind of rotate uh, the Doherty eye. I'll, I'll bring those in and rotate them around. But when, when we, almost all of them pretty much sell right away to the point where they're getting harder to find the last couple times I've tried to order normal rainbow, I say normal rainbow fish, not like the small ones, but the larger ones, they never, they haven't been coming in the last couple months, last few months. So uh, it's, it's annoying. Um, Brooklyn NYC behavioral question had a 55 and now a 75 my neon tetras no longer school together my penguin tetras are chasing each other non-stop should i be worried that they are not schooling anymore no because even this this tank right here, uh, the tank behind my head uh the, the nano tank look at all the i don't if you can probably see it but there's a bunch of small fish back there do they really look like they're schooling they're not so i've got Green Kuba tie in there. I've got the Diamond Head Neon Tetra. Uh, we have the Ember Tetra. And there's a couple different types of small rainbows in there, the Gertrude Eye and the Pass Guy. And look what's going on in there. So if you can see, it's just a bunch of small fish all swimming around. Just swimming. Uh, they are not necessarily schooling together, and that's fine. right? So if they're comfortable in, in what they're doing, so be it. Uh, the fact that your penguin tetras are chasing each other nonstop. that could be stressing the neons out a little bit uh, especially if they're just getting aggressive the solution there is with the 75 gallon if you can if you've got the space to add more penguins that might work out pretty well so that might be helpful uh hold on i saw one oh Skeddy said and i ordered the banded barbs you're really going to love those fish i saw that uh, we have the eight banded barb that is a barb that does not act like a barb it's a very chilled out fish it's it's almost see-through it's almost like a glass barb like a, like a glass like the glass cats where you can see see through them you can see their internal organs but they're really chilled out very well behaved fish you know if you were going to a restaurant and sometimes you're sitting there and you're like wow that family with those kids those are some really well behaved kids i mean they're they're just sitting there they're eating they're talking nice to one another and you're like that's impressive that's the eight banded barb to me it is a very impressive very well behaved fish and I, I am very surprised that they are not far more popular in the hobby brian day said no one has mentioned peacock gudgeons tonight so i will peacock gudgeons <laughs> peacock they're in here give them some love although right there yeah, they're the they're really fun that's the purple spot goby right yeah. there one of the purple spots right there, there he is and then in that tank I, I don't know what goes that tank frustrates me because and i do have to put in some more like schooling type fish because this is not working the way it is because <laughs> we've got the three purple spots and they do this. They just chill. That's, that's Freeze. their MO right there. I'm just going to sit here in one spot, which is totally cool because they're beautiful. We have the peacock gudgeons and I think there is one right there and there's a bunch of them, but they like to go on the rocks and the trees and stuff. And so whatever we have the six gold laser quarries, when we first set that tank up, they were doing loops. I'm like, this is awesome. And now they're also in the rocks and in the, the plants. And what else is in there? Empire gudgeons only come out in the morning. And when they do, they are often really fired up. I mean, the males got the, oh, they got that just yeah, popping so red pretty. color. But often, like when I come down and feed them at night, they, like, they're oh, not showing go. the color. And inevitably, once they're done eating, yeah, they're like, okay, we're out, bye. Cody, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Tank size recommendation for about 10 sunset rainbows. Thinking about getting some of those. And could they go with glass catfish? Glass catfish, absolutely. Sunset rainbows, four foot tank. All right. I would go with a four foot tank. And I think, you know, whether it's a 55, 75, you're going to be in good shape. That's a great combination. Yeah, we've got the glass cats back here with the rainbow fish in that 125. They work out wonderfully. Rainbow fish are not really all that aggressive they're active but the glass cats are also very fast eaters so they're they tend to be more stationary but when it's time to eat they're like pow, pow, pow. They, they move pretty quick for food i think my dear we should be talking about the, yes. the 34 giveaway, already right Dang yeah because you gotta you gotta go pretty soon 
and I want to make sure that you're here for that. Yes. So like I said, everybody, we have a lot of stuff that we're going to be giving away. We don't want to give up. We don't want to give away the giveaway just yet. I'm not. Oh my gosh. I so, was going to shuffle them over okay. like really low. So things that we are giving away, there. It's it's the day of semi-randomness, I suppose. Yes. We have two different, uh, we have a channel sponsor and what I would call a a a channel supporter or someone uh, coming that supports our viewers for sure. Uh, and it's going to all go together here. And so Damar, thank you so much Damar for gifting. Oh my gosh. 10 primetime aquatics memberships. So wow. now in, in the, in the spirit of giving, we've got 10 people here Aww. who are now new prime timers. Thanks to Demars. Thank you so much for doing that. Really appreciate it. That was awesome of you. And hopefully you all enjoy it because of the gift. Okay, are we ready? Oh wait, yeah, thanks Oink. Make sure you're in all messages before I forget to say anything. Yeah. All messages, otherwise you don't get the same, the same order that we get. Okay, so let's talk about what it is we're giving away. Thing number one, we'll, we'll go with this. This is the brand new Amazonas Magazine. And for those of you who've been around the channel for a while, you know that Amazonas gives our viewers a special offer. It is in the description below. So even if you don't win, there is a special offer there where you can get this magazine at a not normal price, but this is awesome. This is the brand new one. We have two copies. This is our personal copy. And then we have one that's wrapped in plastic that hasn't been used, uh, but check this out. I knew you'd love it as soon as we got it in the mail. It's all about neon tetra. Well, not all about, but mostly like the, the main things are all about neon tetras, different yes. types reading, keeping, where they're found. Again, this is like the highest quality magazine out there on the face of the earth at this point. Uh, it's just awesome, absolutely awesome. So someone is gonna get this. Amazonas, like I said, I can't speak highly enough about this. It's my pretty much right there in the top three to five, certainly my favorite fish magazine of all time, but three to five, top three to five periodicals, magazines of any genre. Like uh, that one in Victoria, yeah, ex yeah, top. Right extraordinarily high quality so winner is going to get this and then you well, wait but wait there's more. there's more that same winner is going to get some other things because i you know, i kind of guess i have a theme you know we're talking about amazonas and how cool they are and all these fish but then where they're found if you like tetras often you're going to see things in the water like botanicals so things like this these are catopolis so this is given these were given to us by fritz aquatics they are a channel sponsor they've been a channel sponsor of primetime aquatics for a number of years now absolutely love them they have some super high quality uh, fish tank additives and meds you know we were talking about meds earlier that's what we use when fish get sick we've got all the fritz stuff that we that we need here so catopolis leaves, big leaves now, these are great because if you want the tannins and you want that tannic acid in your aquarium, that can be an antimicrobial. Also, small fish, fish fry, shrimp likes to snack off the surface of the stuff because it starts to house microorganisms and a whole microfauna. Also, if you like that dark water tank, and you, all you have to do is throw these in there and you will get a darker water tank because it will release the tannins. If you don't like that, don't worry. You can boil these things first, still throw them in an aquarium, make the aquarium look a little bit more natural and then they won't turn the water quite as brown. So you're gonna get these. And to go along with the theme, you're going to get these as well. This is the Caesarea cone, Caesarina cones. Mm -hmm. uh, these same thing, except now it's a cone. I'm trying to get the reflection off of there, but now it's a cone. It's not the leaves, it's smaller, right? So for especially important for those of you who have smaller tanks. By the way, the catapa leaves, you can break these up. You don't have to put a big giant leaf. Like I got a five gallon, just covered my whole entire substrate. Don't worry, you can break those apart, but these are small. Same thing, they will release the tannins if you want them to. If you don't want them to do that, boil them, and you can still have a natural look at the bottom of your aquarium, aquarium, and these are really cool. Now, this is more specifically geared towards those who really do want those tannins, and by the way, that can be a really nice thing, especially for a quarantine tank. These are the Katapa tea leaf bags, right? so Katapa, Katapa tea bags, and these you just float kind of like you're making tea, right? Yeah, put them in your uh, hanging pack. Don't boil these because then no why would you tannins. do that? Um, so these you don't want to boil. These you just want to chuck in a filter or just, I guess you could just chuck them right in the tank if you wanted to. But yeah, yeah. you're right. Filter these would, have would be a, a better... much shorter lifespan okay, of so adding color. 
Well, I mean, they'll add it as long as you don't change the water, right? Oh, yeah. But assuming you. But if you do your water changes, yeah, this stuff's going to go away. But again, this is a nice one if you are if you setting up a quarantine tank or or for those of you who are pulling eggs out, like you're breeding angels, you're breeding discus. This might be something really valuable to add to help keep those eggs from getting all fungused up. Last thing, we're staying with Fritz. This, everybody should have this. This is Fritz Zyme 7. It's one of the most used things that we have in the fish room besides just our regular water conditioners. This is your live nitrifying bacteria. And the purpose of this is when you set up a new aquarium, this has got the microbes that convert the nasty ammonia to nasty nitrite, but it also converts the nasty nitrite to nitrate and that's far less toxic. And so we highly, highly, highly recommend this. this is one of the game changers in the aquarium industry is when you have the live nitrifying bacteria it makes starting a new aquarium so much easier. And so one winner, oh my gosh, is going to get all of that stuff. Now, a couple things, you have to live in the connected United States, 48 states, and you have to be over the age of 18 years old to win all of this stuff. And again, we did the whole all messages thing instead of top chat. Uh, before we do the thing, Danny, thank you so much for the super chat. What type of fish would you put in a 150 pond? Write that down because I want to answer that, but I know yep. this is going to go away the minute we start doing this thing. So did you? I do. You got it? Okay, mm -hmm. so here's the deal. What you need to do is you need to pick a number between 50 and 60. Feel free to go ahead and do that now. Oh. First person who gets the right number, you're going to be the winner between, you got it, oh, it's nope. showing through the paper. Yeah, it really right. was. Between 50 and 60. And I think, did we finish oh, wow. already? Uh, you, let's see here. Yep, done. We're done. done. It happened that fast. So we can stop typing the numbers because we have one lucky winner here who is winning the stuff because they typed in the right thing. So now we're just going to check it. We're going to check it amongst all of our <laughs> our many screens here because we like to confirm that what we've got going on what is the got? right thing. So I have uh, right there. That oh. came in right away. It came in right away? Yeah. Or at least somewhat right away. So hold on, give us a second here just to make sure we're confirming all the stuff. And let me see, let me scroll, let me scroll, let me scroll. Do, do, not do. right away. Well, maybe not right away, but oh. it was pretty what fast. What do you have? I have that. Yes. Okay, so the lucky winner, wait, hold on a second. Did I, yes. oh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's so, I, you know what I wish? I wish that these things would I'll have the same colors everywhere. Okay, lucky nice. winner is Harrison Hassel. Harrison, you are the winner of number 53. 53 Yay. is the the one. We had lots of 53s in here. Harrison, on our all of our synced electronic devices, you were the first one. And I know, you know, it just depends on the settings, but we go by what's synced here. And that's how we figure it out. So Harrison, here's what you have to do. You have to send an email to Prime time giveaway. Singular. Prime time giveaway at yahoo.com. Send us your mailing address. And at some point over the next week or so, Joanna will get all this boxed up and sent to you. That's Thank right. you so much for playing this awesome game. Oh my gosh. Where's my so, pad of paper? My official pad of uh, paper. Not down here. This is my area. You can write it there <sighs> in your other booklet. So before we did this, Hold on, let me go all the way down to the bottom now. Uh, we had a question, and the question was, I don't know if I can go that far back. Oh, yeah, here I can. Okay. The question was from Danny. Again, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate it. What type of fish would you put in a 150-gallon pond besides koi? I have <laughs> many, many ideas. Okay. Do you have any ideas? Shrimp. You would do shrimp. Certainly, that is a, a strong possibility. Uh, that to me put, just has a lot of shrimp to catch. It, it would be a lot of shrimp. Uh, it depends on what you're looking for in terms of what do you want to see and also where you live. I just did right. a YouTube short where I showed a cichlid pond, an African cichlid pond. Now, obviously, those temperatures have to be a little bit warmer in that pond, so they can't go super low. You're going to want to maintain that pond in the upper 70s at least. 
So that's something to consider. But a, a African cichlid pond would be insane, and you would definitely would. get some breeding in yeah. there over the summertime. You just have to make sure that that pond water is maintained warm enough. Outside of that, I have two. I have two right off the bat that okay. I would pick. Then bring it. You want to know? Yeah. All right, Florida flagfish, or um, rice mm -hmm. fish. That, I was going to say that too. So Florida flagfish would be awesome. Uh, they they can actually withstand a wide range of temperatures. They can go uh, cooler. They can go really warm. So Florida flagfish are very cool. And in, at least in our area, they're in somewhat demand, and they're not crazy easy to find. The rice fish would be an outstanding choice as well. I think you could get a fair amount of breeding doing rice fish. You probably want to settle on one type just to reduce the likelihood of hybridization. So maybe you're like, okay, I'm going to do the koi rice fish or the black rice fish, or I'm going to do the Those platinums or the javas. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's tons of them. There's, uh, the, we had for a while the red madaka rice fish, which was really cool. So that would be awesome. A lot of your uh, Northern California, okay, so yeah, your summers aren't going to get super, super hot unless you're out into the eastern side, I would guess, right? So yeah, then the rice fish, the Florida flag fish, uh, shrimp would be a really good one. I know they're all smaller. But uh, again, you could do sword tails if you want to see something a little bit larger. You could do sailfin mollies. Those would be a pretty large fish. If you did like the platinum sailfin molly, how cool would that be? You know, so there's you've got some options there. Pick yeah, you do. Uh, white cloud mountain minnows. Do mm -hmm. the long fins. That would be pretty cool as well. You could try mixing and matching a few different types. We did uh, one time bristlenose plecos with the shrimp. And I don't remember what else was in there. Maybe white clouds or something. White clouds and... We got a ton of guppies. guppies. Yeah, I think we threw some guppies or, in there. So. One time we did guppies and endlers. That's, we? yes, we threw them both in there. And then at one point we had bristlenose plecos and they spawned. And then I don't know what happened. Something got in there, a frog or something, because they yeah. we saw a bunch of babies and then they all went away. So we that's the one thing you have to keep in mind is keep the wildlife Occupants out. Yeah. Uh, moving in, saying, hey, thanks. Yeah. Are have you to go leaving now. us? Okay. We have to go now. Everybody Bye say goodbye everybody. to this young lady. Say goodbye to Juice Box. And, and then don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be here. We're going to still keep this party keep this party going here. Can you take your chair with you? Sure. Because that would be a really nice, considerate thing to do. And I'm going to scooch, 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 scooch. Oh, my gosh. Just messed up my whole audio situation. I am going to turn this mic off so we don't get any weird kind of echo 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 uh ej says chili raz boris yeah that would be kind of cool too really hard to see but it'd be interesting if you put like a ton of aquatic plants in there and some java moss uh, maybe just maybe you would get some breeding here let me i gotta fix this thing i feel like it's a it's all messed up over over here it's all messed up okay so back to what we were talking about Brian said, wait a minute, endlers are guppies. Guppies are endlers. Um, no, not really. They're, endlers are smaller. They're, they're, they're different. They are definitely different, but they can hybridize. And I think that's what we wound up. We wound up with just kind of a mess in that pond. That, but it was, it was a cool mess. That's, that's what it was. Inkleek says, my local fish store made me buy a different type, made me buy different types of test water things. So I got an Aquion test strips. Are those good? They're fine. So I know a lot of people don't like the test strips because it's, they're maybe possibly not as accurate as the liquid test kits. And while there's some truth to that, a lot of people get caught up on what color is it exactly? Oh, what is this? Is this dark orange? Is it red? Is it? I don't care about that. What I care about is, one, I should not be seeing any color change for ammonia or nitrite. And that's one of the main things that I'm looking at when I'm testing water. If there's a problem, what? It's one of the first things you want to know. Is there ammonia or is there nitrite in the water? And that one, I'm just looking for a color change. If there is a color change, I know I've got some issues going on there. Uh, as far as nitrate, get me close. I, I, what does it matter if it's 40 parts per million or 60 parts per million? I know at that point, hey, this tank needs a water change because I would like to get it in the range where it's somewhere between 10 and 20. So I don't, sorry, didn't mean to bump the mic. Uh, I don't use them necessarily to get an exact concentration of these things i'm using them to get me in the ballpark and they serve that purpose and they're a whole lot easier to use those five and one six and one test strips you can just go poop shake it around a couple seconds some of the tests take a minute or so to read but then you're done you're not trying to mix in your 
if the process is too difficult, you're just not going to do it. And so for a lot of people, it's like, yeah, I can bust out the liquid test kit and I am going to get better results. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't want to do it. And I've, I've, I'm the same way. I've got a liquid test kit. And thankfully, I don't really have a whole lot of issues. So I don't really test the water all that much. But if I did, it's like, oh, man, I got to bust that thing out. I would so much rather just dip a test strip in the water and be done. Uh, Becky says, how often should I test my water? I only test water if there is an issue. And at the beginning, when I set up an aquarium, I make sure that, you know, as I'm adding fish, I'm making sure my Fritz Lime 7 is doing what it's supposed to do and that I haven't overstocked an aquarium based on the amount of live nitrifying bacteria I have in the tank based on my filtration. Obviously, here we use a lot of used filter media because it's really easy to swap between tanks. But I, after, I mean, the, the water hardness really isn't going to change all that much. Your GH, your KH, your pH, unless you've got really soft water. If your KH is very low, then yeah, you could have some potential pH swings. But outside of that, it's, I don't really test. I mean, I can't remember, uh, when was the last time I tested any of the, I'm looking in there, it's the fish, that's where the fish room is. I don't know when the last time was I tested water. It was, it was maybe a year ago. I, I don't know. So I guess the bottom line is I don't really test all that much. And if you got a problem, yeah, maybe you want to see if there's ammonia or nitrite or did something happen to the pH or does my, you know, do I have a low GH or KH and that kind of thing. But other than that, I don't bother. It's And especially with the liquid test kit, like I said, if I had test strips, I might actually test it more often. I don't really think it would really make that much, much of a difference, but it's it's possible that it it could. Andy, thank you so much for being a member of the last 19 months. Have you tried the aquarium co-op? Uh, Oh, hold on. I'm trying to read this off the, the other screen here. Taper for this. Oh, uh, taper for the sponge filter. It makes them almost sound. I have not yet tried that. Uh, I do need to. I, I have the box that you sent me, so I just need to put it on a sponge filter and see how it does. I, I don't doubt that it's going to be that it's going to do everything it says it's supposed to do. So it, it's interesting because we, when we talk about sponge filters, often people are really hung up on those uplift tubes and it, there, it is absolutely true that the higher, the taller that uplift tube is, the more suction you're going to get through the sponge filter, the the more flow you're going to get, and the better the filter is going to do at getting getting stuff out of the water. But at the same time, there's a trade-off there, right? So the longer that uplift tube, the more that you're going to see. All right. So just generally speaking, for those of you who are you know thinking about sponge filters, I like to have sponge filters that are not all that visible, you know, ideally you just, it's there, but it's not like, oh, bam, here's my filtration in the middle of the tank. So anytime you're adding an uplift tube or an extra tall one, you're going to see your sponge filter more. The other thing is, and people ask all the time, oh, you're not running your sponge filters correctly because you don't have the uplift tubes in there at all. It's like, well, define correctly. Because for me, for the tanks that I'm doing, correctly means I need enough water to move through the sponge filter to accomplish biological filtration with and uh, without that that uplift tube it does that it's it's a non-issue it's a non-factor if i have the flow going strong enough it's also doing a decent amount of of the mechanical filtration without the uplift tube could it do better sure but the reason why you see so many of my tanks that don't have an uplift tube is because fish can get caught in there and then they, they, then they can't get out. So for instance, bristlenose plecos, trust me when I tell you, they will get themselves wedged in there. And if you don't notice it right away, they will die in there and you'll see bristlenose pleco pieces coming out of there. Some of your loaches will get themselves wedged in there to the point where they can't get out. And so anytime where I've got a tank where I've, and, and every tank has bristlenose plecos, but especially like my breeding tanks and stuff, I would prefer not to have those uplift tubes there because they absolutely will get themselves wedged in there and not be able to get back out. But back to the original question. No, I haven't tried it yet. And I am going to, because I think it, from the silence perspective, that is certainly a, 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 a benefit, a plus to not have to listen to the sponge filters. MNC, thank you so much for being a member of the last nine months. Prime timer. Make sure everyone hits the thumbs up. Sure. I think MNC has a has a good request. Why don't we we do that? We can kick the like button right in the throat. How's that sound? Karate chop it right in the face. That's what you're gonna do to the thumbs up button. 
Make it more exciting. Okay, hold on a second here. Oop. Well, whatever. Terry, I clicked on the wrong one, but I wanted to answer this one anyway. Terry says, would my fire eel and flag tail and ghost knife be fine with the, I, uh, the buy shirt? I have no idea because I have only had one buy shirt in my entire life. I can't remember if I, well, I kept the ghost knife. I can't remember even how large it got and what I kept it with. And yeah, the fire eel, I, I really don't know. I mean, if you had a large enough tank, if you had a 240 or something like that, possibly, but I, I don't know for sure. New friend says, oh no, my uh, bristles go into the short little tubes, better remove. Well, listen, if they're getting out, then so be it. Then don't worry about it. But when they get larger is when they can get them wedged themselves wedged in there. Uh, I'm not worried about small ones. Small ones, they don't get themselves stuck in there just like like the smaller loaches. I don't worry about like coolie loaches or something, but uh, some of the larger loaches like the uh, the red tail botillas that I have, I've had those guys get stuck in there and then they die. So um, obviously a way to get around that is if you had some kind of a screen on the top of that or if there's a screen on the elbow for the uplift tube that will solve that problem for the most part. It's Alex now. Thank you so much for the super chat. I have a sword. I have sword tail fry in my community tank. I wasn't ready for. Can I do anything to help them beyond plant moss coverage and grinding up food? That's fine. Now, this, the live bears are not picky. Grinding up the food is fine. The biggest thing that you're going to have to deal with is if it's a community tank. Other fish are probably going to try to eat them if the fry will fit in their mouth. So if you're going to lose the fry, it's not going to be because they are starving to death. If you're if you're using powder, crushed up food, they will figure out how to eat it. That's just what they do. The live bears are not there. You know, the sword tails, the platys, the mollies, the guppies, the endlers, uh, tiger limia, not at all difficult to feed and raise. It's just, like I said, if they're in a community tank, even with full size sword tails, that's when you could potentially run into an issue where maybe you start losing some just because they're like, hey, food, this is great. Thanks. But it won't be because they're most likely not eating. It's a good question. Hobby Farm says, would you rather have one 125 or 255 gallon tanks? That's a really good question. I don't like that question because, and here's why I don't. The 125 is one of my favorite sized aquariums. So I always talk about smaller aquariums. I love the 20 long, medium size. I love the 40 breeder. Medium large, I'm a big fan of the 75 gallon. Once we get to the six foot tanks, I think the 125 is a very, very practical tank. Although if I could fit the 180s down here, I would have that as a slight preference. However, I really like the 125s. Now the 55s, the advantage there obviously is you're setting up two completely different ecosystems. You can do two completely different things with those aquariums. Like, hey, maybe I wanna do nano fish in one and have some something completely different in the other live bearers and another one and breed the fish so oh my gosh if those were my and that's the thing too is that if, if i don't have any other aquariums would i rather have two different ecosystems maybe i man that's a tough one i don't know i don't know what i would do i think it would just depend on my mood and i could see myself changing my mind on a weekly basis i could see going in one direction, be like, all right, I'm getting the 125. There's different, the advantage there being you can do larger fish. You've got a lot more options when it comes to stocking. Uh, it's a six foot tank, which is pretty impressive. And I could see myself setting that up and be like, oh, I want to do something else. Or I want to, I saw this cool fish and I wish I had the 255. So if you are really certain about what you want to keep, maybe the 125 is the way to go. But if you're someone who likes to change things up, maybe you want to do the 255s. Whip says, I haven't kept the flag tail, uh, but I have, but I currently have the other three coexisting. Ghost knife are not aggressive, though eventually they will get big enough that most fish will fit in their mouth. Yeah, awesome. Appreciate the additional information. Whip is a monster fish keeper, much more so than I am. Glad you're here and able to answer the question. Answer the question. Answer the question, Whip. I almost said flip. Whip. Uh, sound pitch. Thank you very much for the super chat. Coming back to the hobby after a year of burnout. Love the Tank Talk podcast. Thank you for what you do. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for being part of the Tank Talk podcast. We really enjoy doing those. So that's awesome. You know, and that's interesting too, because there, I hear that all the time where people 
get less interested in fish for a while for a season. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know why, it, like, it just seems like when someone's into a hobby and they are feeling less excited about the hobby, why they feel like just because they're in it that they have to make a lifelong commitment to something that they're doing if it's not something that is fitting that particular season of life for any number of reasons and that goes for fish keeping or anything else just because you have a hobby and you get into a hobby and you love it doesn't mean that you are going to be 100% into it for the rest of your life. And sometimes you will, you'll do things like, Hey, I was really into fish. And then I got really busy. Things happened, family stuff. And I couldn't care for the aquariums as much, or I just, Hey, I just lost interest. There's sometimes you don't need a reason. That's the other thing too. You don't have to have an excuse or a reason why you stop enjoying something you used to enjoy. Uh, I, I use my, my younger son as an example. He's somebody who gets really into stuff. He's really into it for a while and then he moves on. And I think a lot of times as parents, we want our kids to like get super into something and be the best at it, just be the absolute best and train or, or really focus on it or study and, and just be the best at that one thing. And it's like, well, that's not what young people do. Young people explore, they, they get into things, they enjoy them, they figure out, okay, this is really enjoyable or this is not. And maybe they hold on to a small piece of that hobby or a small piece of that, that thing that they do and they add that to their life. Well, we, had, we as adults do the same thing, right? We get into stuff and we get into hobbies and we, we we're at it for a while. You get burnout, sometimes you gotta move on. And now you come back to it and you came back to it and you didn't have to you know trudge through and just man up and tough it out and come back later. and just enjoy it. And if you stop enjoying it, stop doing it. First Ginger says, what's in the low boy behind you? Wife and I can't figure it out. Monsters. Okay, so right there. Hold on, let me, uh, right, wrong hand. This is so hard to do on camera. Right there, that's a purple spot goby. There are three of them in that aquarium. Yeah, they get about five inches or so. Insanely awesome color. I had these fish when I was in my late teens, early 20s, and I, hadn't, I, I couldn't find it for the longest time. And then they started coming around again, and I knew that that was like one of my bucket list fish that I wanted to get back at some point. Extremely awesome fish, not super active, but and they've got a medium-sized mouth, so you gotta be a little bit careful about smaller fish. But yeah, that's the purple spot over here, there, wherever it is. Uh, and then we've got peacock gudgeons in there. So it's a smaller, it basically looks like the purple spot, only a little bit lighter and smaller. We have empire gudgeons, which you probably, I don't think they're out. There's one random black molly in there, six gold laser quarries, and what else is in there? I think that's it because we had a big rainbow gudgeon and it, a rainbow goby, and it jumped. It jumped all the way to the stairs. It, it was about 10 feet away from the tank. That was heartbreaking because that was, that was my one of my favorites. But I kind of knew this is an uncovered tank. I was planning on cutting out a piece of, um, of the, uh, the stuff, the polycarbonate, and kind of putting that around like I have on the other low boy. And I was you know, just one of those things. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. And I didn't get to it. And now that's on me because now I have one of my favorite fish that is no longer with us. And that's my fault. So yeah, but that's what's behind us. I'm gonna be adding some more schooling fish to that tank just to get some more activity in there. Hopefully bring out more of those peacock gudgeons, the empire gudgeons and the um, gold laser quarries. Yeah. All right, let me see here. Daniel says, any thoughts on dwarf chain loaches? Thinking about getting a pack of six for my community tank. I've had them, love them. Uh, thoughts, they're very small, right? So you're looking at a, a loach that's gonna max out right around an inch and a half or so. So type of fish where if you're you've got a 20 gallon that is going to be a good fit they will eat snails so when we had them in quarantine and when we had the rack of tens on this side of the uh, when it used to be the fish room they polished off all of the snails in about the six or eight weeks that they were in the quarantine tank as we were bringing them the swaps and stuff they can be a little bit more rambunctious than other loaches even though they're small they can they can harass other fish a little bit more than other loaches will not horribly so but you got to be somewhat careful when you have other really small nano fish just keep an eye on them make sure that they're not overly harassing other fish and i would probably also make them i might make them my only bottom dwelling fish in an aquarium so and that is uh 
I'm not as excited to mix them with like Cory Cats and things like that, just because again, they can get a little bit more assertive at the bottom of the aquarium. They're also expensive. So just, just keep that in mind. A lot of people, they think, okay, this is a small loach. It shouldn't cost that much because it's small, but they're actually, they're, for a loach, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty pricey, but really cool fish. I love them. And they look super cool. They got that kind of checkerboard sort of look to them. Yeah, it is very cool. Jennifer says, I wanted some to eat my snails. I wanted some to eat some snails, but I got an assassin snail. Puts hurting on the pest snails along with my betta. Assassin snails are a great option. We've got assassin snails in a number of tanks in the fish room. And if it's funny because... If you look at our videos from three, four years ago, maybe five years ago, we had a number of tanks that had a fair amount of snails and they're almost all gone. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One, we're not doing as much breeding of bristlenose plecos anymore. That's where a lot of the snails originated from. Uh, two, we have really figured out how to feed the bottom dwelling fish without snails getting to the food. The only tank that we currently have in the fish room or the gallery, nothing in the gallery where really has snails, but on the other side in the fish room, the only aquarium where it's like, wow, that's a fair amount of snails is in our bristlenose breeding 40 gallon breeder. And that's because we have to feed sinking foods and now it's game on. The bristlenose are down there, all the Malaysian trumpet snails come out. But for the most part, yeah, we don't have a lot going on. And I think what I was gonna say is I think a lot of the reason for that is we, we have in many of our tanks, there are fish that will eat the snails or we've got the assassin snails and assassin snails are so cool. I mean, yes, they are going to grow. Yes, they are going to, to multiply like other snails do, but they burrow. You often don't see them when the lights are on and they are actually really cool looking. All right, let me see here. Hunter says, do you have a species profile on peacock gudgeons? If not, could you? Oh yeah, that was... I'm going to warn you that species profile was one of the first videos we ever did. In fact, I think it might have been video number three. So if you search Peacock Gudgeon Primetime Aquatics, you're going to see a video that is prob well, it's not up to the standards that we currently have in primetime as, you know, as a YouTube channel, but the information is outstanding. The video footage of the actual Peacock Gudgeons is pretty cool, but it's a little different. I mean, but it's out there and we have bred at one point we we had i don't know well over a thousand of those things we we bred the heck out of those fish and uh i've pretty much had them in the fish room i don't want to say non-stop but for the fish room that is it's now been up and running i want to say at least eight years i mean before we always had tanks on this side when we had like a tv and a couch down here but the actual fish room fish room build out since that time almost consistently we've had peacock gudgeons in here Real Madrid, welcome, glad you're here. It's been a little while. Uh, good morning from Kurdistan. Well, good morning to you. Uh, just curious, which one of the plants in the fish hobby is edible? Not, it's like I'm gonna eat, start eating them. I have no idea. I personally, I wouldn't eat any of these plants, but that's just me. I don't, that's a great question. Does anybody, I don't even, anybody, if anybody even knows that. Um, I, I just, as a general rule of thumb, I don't eat fish tank plants. I don't know if there is like, you know, like you've got like the seaweed, right? But I'm not so sure about freshwater plants. Cody says, I love my ram's horn snails, mystery snails and rabbit snails. I could never get assassin snails. You know, those are all great snails I, and they are controllable. The only caveat to that are the Malaysian trumpet snails. Those bad boys, they are a little bit more problematic so yeah, the ram's horn, I always found that as long as you're controlling food, you're going to control their populations just fine. You know, a lot of people freak out about the ram's horn snails and the pond snails, but even in the old YouTube, the uh, live stream studio with those four smaller tanks that were behind us, we had ram's horn snails in those tanks. We had a couple of, of larger ones and then you'd see the little babies and you'd never see them again. And we had nothing in there really that I could think of that would eat snails. I mean, we had white clouds, we had dwarf rasboras, we had uh, the Florida least killifish and maybe some amano shrimp. So there was nothing really in there that would eat the snails. It was just, there was no food falling to the bottom. And so they really didn't have a place, they didn't, they didn't have food. So they, they just controlled their, that's how we controlled their population. 
Oh, that's funny. Whip says, yeah, in that video, that Peacock Gudgeon video, Jason looks like a young whippersnapper with a close cropped goatee. Yep, that was, that was me back in the day, 47 feet away from the camera with horrible audio and suspect uh, video skills. Not that I'm a professional now, but it's, it's better than it was back then. You would hope that that would be the case. All right, let me see here. Uh, Wolfgang, I'm curious how much time you spend on your beard. It's rad. Well, thank you. Zero. I basically, it just does what it does. I mean, now it's a mess, man, because it's getting humid out and it's been humid. So looking at it now, I'm like, now that you mentioned, I'm going to fix it up here. But I absolutely spend no time. I, I mean, I'll trim it every four or five weeks, just a little bit, just kind of go around. But that's it. It's, I wake up and however it is, it is, which is usually like this. So I guess I've been lucky in that way. Okay. Jennifer says, just no, don't eat aquarium plants. Lots of reasons why. I'm sure there is. I, it's not something I think I would ever try to do. All right, let me see here. CSV says, I had an issue with Malaysian trumpet snails in a tank till I put my Fahaka puffer in there. Yep, that would do it. Yeah, the, the problem with Malaysian trumpet snails, and I, I probably should have finished my thought, is their shells are, and especially because of their shape, they're a lot harder to break. So some of the fish that normally eat snails, they struggle with the Malaysian trumpet snails. Now the assassin snails, they will get to them. It takes them a longer time, but even some of the loaches and stuff will struggle with them. I have found the cichlids, a lot of the African cichlids, they, they will absolutely get through them if you give them enough time, especially if you've got a lot of them because their, their, uh, their inner jaws are, are strong enough to crack those shells and, and deal with it. But yeah, unfortunately, sometimes they're a little bit harder. To, and the other problem too is they burrow, which actually is a good thing because you don't often see them as much when the lights are on, unless you've got gravel, then they can't burrow as easily. But if you've got sand, the Malaysian trumpet snails burrow, and then you don't see them as much unless you turn the lights out. And then when you turn the lights out, come back, you know, come back to your tank, and kind of turn a room light on, they'll be all over the place. So I don't mind them for that reason. In gravel, they can look a little rough, a little bit tough to, to look at, but yeah, they the cichlids, they kind of sift through the sand a little bit, so they'll get to them, but a lot of fish don't do that as much. Okay, let me see here. What did I see? I saw, I saw the question, and then it went sneaking up above. Hold on. Regina says, duckweed is edible. I don't know about that, but I do know that duckweed is a good fish food, and if you... Let me rephrase a lot of what some people will do is they will take the duckweed and dry it out and they will put it in like make fish pellets and stuff or put it in some rapashi and that will they will feed the fish like that. I have also noticed and this a tank in this tank right here, this 125. And I thought that this was the case before, but the rainbow fish in there are eating the duckweed because we had a fair amount of duckweed until I put the rainbow fish in there and it is slowly going away. And I also noticed that in a few of the tanks when I was when I would keep them in quarantine is if you've got a lot of food competition, they they default to eating duckweed. At least mine have been doing that. I'm not going to say, hey, if you've got a duckweed problem, go out and buy a bunch of rainbow fish and it's going to all be gone. I don't necessarily know that to be a fact, but I do know that those guys in there are eating duckweed. And it's not the geophagus because I've had plenty of tanks with geophagus covered in duckweed. It's not the snakeskin barbs because I've had lots of tanks with with uh, duckweed and the, with the snakeskin barb, same thing with the, the um, glass cats. The only thing that's in there that would be eating the duckweed are the rainbow fish. And like I said, when I have been, you know, oh, I quarantined 40 of them in a 40 breeder, duckweed gone. So the other one that was really polished off the duckweed quick was the melon barb. Holy cow, I, I put them in a 20 gallon and the thing was, there was a ton of duckweed in there. And within about five days, it was completely gone. They had polished it all off. So it was pretty cool. There's actually quite a bit of fish that will eat that stuff. What about Julitochromus? Will they eat Malaysian trumpet snails? They will. It takes them a little while. They're not going to They're not gonna necessarily put a huge dent in your Malaysian trumpet snail population. But I have found quite a few no longer existing Malaysian trumpet snails in some of our Julitochromus tanks. Carl, absolutely. When I, kept, when I kept Congo Tetras, they went mad on some duckweed. Absolutely, they do. I've got them in a 40 breeder. Uh, the other ones in that 40 breeder that eat, and I, I wasn't sure at first, but then uh, Kevin confirmed it for me, is the Volcano Bitterling. They love duckweed as well. So between the Congos and the Volcano Barbs that I have in that tank, 
There is absolutely not a speck of duckweed anywhere. Chelsea says, I noticed that my multi shell dwellers are darker in color than others. Is this because they are breeding? I found a few babies in the tank and not sure why some are darker and some are lighter. That can certainly be the case. So when they are competing for space for females, sometimes they will darken up as a show of uh, either aggression or kind of territorial thing. So uh, that can happen. Absolutely. Jennifer says, melon barbs, didn't know they eat duckweed. Oh my gosh, yeah, they took care of, a lot of the barbs do. I, I, although, again, not the snakeskin barbs, the eight-banded barbs, sorry, they're not eating duckweed either, but the um, mascara barbs, when I was quarantining those, they polished off all my duckweed. The melon barbs did. I, we've kept so many barbs lately. Um, we have the eight-banded melons, mascara. The snakeskins are in here. I can't remember the other barbs that we had recently, but yeah, they were doing that. Uh, goldfish, absolutely. I would take big scoops, and I still do. I'll take scoops of, of duckweed and put it in the top 75 where I've got that Anubius tank where the five goldfish are in there. They polish it off. And in my 125s, pretty much most African cichlids will eat the duckweed, and a lot of your south, especially your medium to larger South and Central American cichlids, will eat it as well. Brian Day says, how about tiger barbs? I don't know. I haven't kept tiger barbs in a really long time. And when I had tiger barbs, I had zero duckweed in the fish room. So I'm not sure if they would eat it or not. Spencer says, how many schooling fish could I have in a 40 gallon with my betta? I thought that was the one we already answered. Um, so yeah, I mean, you got your neon types, your ember tetras, your, uh, a lot of your smaller rainbows. But in terms of quantity, you, I mean, it depends on how many, it depends on the size. So if you're staying around that one, one and a half inch mark, if you wanted to do 20, 25 at least, start there and see what that looks like, you know, and then split it up however you want amongst the different fish. But I would keep at least eight to 10 of any one type of schooling fish. I think that would work. Brooklyn says, I got an AquaClear 110 on my 75. My friend gave me an Eheim 2217. I'm thinking of changing it, but the hang on back 110 has been perfect. I don't know if I should go the canister route. What do you think? Well, it depends on how much you love to clean canister filters. So if the 110 is working on the 75, your water is clear and everything is doing well, I probably wouldn't change it. I would just leave the AquaClear 110 on there. Now, the advantage to do, using the Eheim is it might possibly be a little bit quieter. You might get a little bit more flow and you're certainly going to get a lot more directional flow, right? So all of these tanks here have canister filters on them and you've got the intake on one side and you got the return on the other. And so the water is going, it's flowing throughout the entire tanks. So you're getting really good water circulation where with a hang on back filter, that 110, I'm assuming it's probably in the middle of the 75 and it's kind of doing this, right? And if it's doing a great job, leave it right because the 110 has got a lot of flow that aqua clear 110 it, it definitely puts out some flow so overall water surface agitation water movement is probably not going to be an issue there but keep in mind once you switch over to that canister filter the downside is going to be when you have to maintain that filter it might not be as often as the aqua clear 110 but when you do have to maintain it it's a little bit more of a pain and i'm with these ones i've maintained uh, that one, the Lake Tanganyika 75, the other four I haven't even broken open yet. That's going to happen not this weekend, the weekend after, because now we're into it for a few months, and I can already see on this tank, and then even on the nano tank over here, it's about right. I say nano tank. That's the 125 gallon nano tank. It's about time. It's about time I crack those bad boys open, see how things are going inside. But it's going to be a pain. I know. To look at all five of those Eheim, or I'm sorry, all five of those canister filters, I've got Fubal 407s on the tanks on the 75s. And then here, the 125s have the Oaza uh, Biomaster Thermal 850s. And then this one here has got, I think it's the 350 Biomaster. So I'm going to have to go through all those, and it's probably going to take me an afternoon. And that's just the way it is, or at least a few hours. Shimu, first of all, thank you so much for the super chat. Would it be safe to add some? little three quarter inch pandagars to a tank that already has for a four inch one probably i don't think the pandagars are super overly aggressive i mean especially if you've got some space in there again i'm not i don't do a ton of pandagars i haven't had them in the fish room for a while but as long as 
the the fish that you're adding are not you know super small so they don't fit inside the larger fish's mouth but yeah it's you're, you're probably pretty close to being somewhat safe there michael says what are your favorite fish stores in the chicagoland area believe it or not for having such a large area there aren't that many fish at least compared to when i was growing up in my teens and 20s there aren't that many fish stores really left i do uh, in Lombard, Illinois, there's Trop Aquatics, and I've been going to that store since I was probably 17. It's since switched owners. It's switched locations a long time ago, switched owners, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago. And I like that store. Uh, fish Planet up in Deerfield is another one, especially if you're looking for nano-type fish. Uh, I, I like that place. And then the other one is in South Elgin. It's Zuze, like spelled the letter Zoo and then X-A-E. Yeah, XAE, uh, Zuse. Those are all that I would, you know, if, if I want to go to a, a pet store around where I live, that those would probably be the three main ones. All right, let me see here. Oh, hold on, wait a minute. Whip says, Jason, you don't have to monkey with a canister filter for at least a month and sometimes two or three or four or six months. Ben Ochart went, I think, a year or maybe it was John and... It wasn't even that bad. Yeah, I know. So these these tanks, believe it or not, have been set up now for maybe three months, like some of these newer ones. So it's it's about that time. Like I said, you can tell often when a canister filter is like, yeah, it might be time when the water isn't as crystal clear as it was when you first set it up. And that's, especially with the 125s, it's starting to get there. It, it's still water still looks good. But it's at a point now where I'm like, I should probably go ahead and just check out and see what's going on. Because I really do, you know, being a gallery sort of look, I really do want to come down here and be like, all right, the water is crystal clear. That's, that's kind of what I want to see. All right, 73 Chevy says, I bought a couple of Geophagus a week and a half ago. The female now won't eat, but looks fine. I'm treating them now for a day with Paraclans. Anything else you would recommend or just wait? Uh, let's see here. Female now won't eat. Yeah, that's a little that's a little um, little odd. If they were eating when you first got them, and now all of a sudden they're off food, and there's, they're not, the female's not being bullied or chased around or, or put into a corner, then yeah, I might. Th that's a logical thing with the paracleanse or even the expel pee. I like to use those two in combination. I found that to work the best. I don't remember which one is which anymore, but one of them I believe is metronidazole and the other one is levamisole. So I love that combination because I've had problems when I use just metronidazole. It doesn't work the way it did 15, 20 years ago. I think that is definitely a medication that has been overused in the hobby to the point where it is becoming less effective. And so when I use those two in combination, that really tends to help. Uh, as always, when you're using these meds, uh, that can be a little bit hard on, on the cycle for some of the meds. But yeah, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a bad thought if they stopped eating and they're not being bullied or anything like that. One of the things I always say too is if the fish wasn't eating from the start, you think it's just because, all right, they're trying to eat, but they're spitting the food out and there's, there is no in, you know, internal parasite, the go-tos for me that fish will always eat. Tiny fish will always eat live baby brine. Larger fish will always, not always, but usually eat frozen bloodworms. Now, I don't feed those to Mbuna. I wouldn't feed those to Trophius or something. But if they're not eating that stuff, then usually there's something going on. Emma B, hello. Been a while since I joined the streams. Well, I'm glad you're here joining the stream today. Very cool. All right, let me see. Hold on. Where did it go? JC's Aquarium says, I increased the number of angelfish I was keeping and noticed my black neons and glow light neons swimming together more now. The behavior changes have been so cool to watch. That is absolutely true. Uh, when you put fish in an aquarium that are a little bit larger, that is the one thing that Joanna and I have talked about with this 125 here with all these schooling fish that don't school at all is we're thinking about putting in some, not fish large enough to eat them because that would, defeat the whole purpose but fish that are going to be a little bit larger than because they're all the same size and they're all about an inch and so if you put a three inch fish in there that has a mouth not large enough to eat the fish obviously that might actually encourage a little bit of schooling behavior so that is definitely a thing that can happen oh where did it go 
Carl says, would six Festivums work in a 125? I'm trying to do a Peru-inspired tank with Angels, Cardinals, Romino's Tetras, and some small Plecos. I think that that's a, that's a possibility. I would a tank like that. I'm, I'm thinking you're probably going to have some rocks and some driftwood and some plants. Uh, yeah, I would give it a go in a 125. I think that would be pretty cool. And your Tetris are pretty big, so you, Cardinals get decent size. Romino's get pretty big, so you don't have to worry about it. It's not like you're throwing tiny Rasboras in there. What's up, Blake? Uh, our pistogram is safe with snails. Um, I so all right. My default position is I don't trust any cichlids around snails that I care about. So if I've got nearites or mystery snails, I just don't trust them because they might be fine for a while. And for some people, I'm sure some of you are like, oh my gosh, I've kept my pistols with mystery snails forever and I've never had a problem. And then inevitably there are going to be some of you like, oh yeah, I, I made the mistake of putting some mystery snails in my Episto tank and they didn't survive. A really great example was I had, of all fish, shell dwellers. So I had some, the Simless tank. I used to have the Simless on the other side in a 20 long. And right above that was a mystery snail breeding tank. Well, somehow, some way, I, I suspect when Eli was doing gravel vacking, a couple of the snails got caught up in the gravel vac. He might have either they were sticking to it or whatever he put the gravel back in the tank below started doing all the siphoning and those snails wound up in the tank they were absolutely huge so they were some of the biggest mystery snails i've ever had and the simless left them alone the entire time that they were alive the, i mean the mystery snails eventually died after a couple of years but it wasn't like the simless attacked them they just eventually got old and died so you would you probably wouldn't expect mystery snails to survive in a simless tank and nine times out of ten they probably wouldn't but in that case they did it was really weird good question does anyone know a good store that ships fish in canada i don't think oh i don't know i shouldn't say that but i don't know if fish stores in the u.s would ship to canada i can't imagine that would be very economically feasible you'd probably have to have anybody who knows of fish stores in Canada that ships throughout the country. It gets a little weird once you're trying to cross borders and stuff. <laughs> Brian says, wait, is this Jason or John? I'm watching KG Tropicals, right? We get, I am already preparing myself for that to happen at Aquashella. I, I cannot tell you how many times someone has come up to me and started talking to me about a video or be like, oh man, thank you so much for making this video. It was so awesome. And they start explaining the video and it dawns on me about three minutes into the conversation. That's not my video. I, I might've made a video on the subject, but I didn't say any of those things or I just never even addressed that subject in all of the time I've been on YouTube. So it's at that point I realized they think that I'm John. What gets more confusing is there are times when John will be walking with Joanna going somewhere or I will be walking with Lisa. And in fact, the last Aquashella, Lisa needed to get something. I don't know where John was. I went with her. And as we were in the, in the time we were walking through the Aquashella, we probably got stopped, I don't know, three or four times. And people just assumed, I don't know if they assumed that Lisa was Joanna or that I was John, but they just assumed that they were it was just the people they see on YouTube all the time. So yes, it happens. In fact, John just, I think he posted something on Instagram that somebody had asked him about a video, but thought it was me and used and, and called him my name on his channel. It's kind of funny. It was pretty funny, man. Oh, all right. So now we got some people coming in and saying, yeah, there's some, there's some places that ship to Canada. Dan's predatory fins. All right, cool. So we've got some options there. Very cool. Whip says, I don't get that. I don't see that much of a resemblance. Maybe I'm just weird. Well, I don't either because I'm me, but hey, you know, so apparently a lot of people do. I, it, it is insane how many comments we have seen on the, when we do the Tank Talk podcast together where people have said, oh my gosh, all these years I thought I was watching the same person and it turns out that we're actually two different people. So, because we're, you know, on the podcast together. Okay, let me see. Where, where, where? Spencer says, thanks for the ideas this fall. I got a seven and a half gallon with a Betta and two Cory Cats. I did not know that Cory Cats could not go in that size tank and upgraded this summer. So I'm thinking 18 green neons. 
Uh, in the larger tank, I'm thinking, yeah, that would be cool with the Corys and the 18 green neons. 18 green neons and a 7.5 probably wouldn't work so well because they would also like some space. But, yeah, in the larger tank, very cool. And then, again, yeah, you leave the beta in the 7.5. That's, that's awesome. Love it. Dylan says, do you want freshwater shrimp? And if so, what kinds are your favorite? I have freshwater shrimp. And so on the other side of the fish room in a 40 gallon, we have a blue dream Neocaridina breeding tank that we've been breeding these blue dreams for many, many years. They are so awesome. They come out in a nice, deep, dark blue. Absolutely love them. We have a mono shrimp upstairs that are eventually going to be moving into the 125 over here. Uh, we have bred... Let's see, the, the red cherries, the pumpkins, the yellows. We've had black rose. We've had the, uh, I think they were called snowball. or the, They were white neocaridina, but they've all been neocaridina. We have kept the caridinas a few times, but our water is pretty hard. I like to keep the, all my tanks are the same temperature, so they're all kicking right around 77, 78 degrees down here. And I've just found that the neos, they do well in the harder water and they don't mind the temperatures. They, they, their lifespan is a little bit shorter than if they were cooler temperatures. They tend to breed faster at these temps, but absolutely love shrimp, love them. I think at this point we've had almost all the color varieties of the neos. Kayla says, I ordered some peacock gudgeons and have really enjoyed your species spotlight videos about them. Well, thank you so much. You're going to love those fish. I mean, they are, how they are not one of the most popular fish in all the aquarium hobby, I do not know. Because a peacock gudgeon is a fish that is going to max out at less than two inches. Males and females both show outstanding color. I have found them to be relatively agreeable fish. We've kept more than a dozen, 15 to 20, sometimes more in a 20 long leave each other alone. I've, like I said, we've raised thousands of those fish. We've had them in our fish room fairly consistently. They bred in our harder water, but they can go down pH below seven. They don't mind a pH above eight, you know, within reason, like eight, 8.2 is where we're at. But yeah, absolutely love those fish. Jennifer says, I have very soft water, pH five and a half, and my blue dreams are thriving. Very nice. Yeah. The Neocaridina are they are very agreeable little invertebrates. And Bruce says peacock gudgeons are impossible to find in New York. Yeah, they, I, I just, I don't understand. They're, and the thing is, they are readily available at, you know, you go to the wholesalers, you look at import lists, they're there. They're, I have never had a problem when I've ordered peacock gudgeons with them not coming in. They are always available because part of the reason is breeding them is actually not that difficult raising the fry because they're so tiny might be a little bit more challenging but for these large you know, uh, fish breeders it's a it's a relatively easy process and they kick out a lot of fry every time they breed they really do so i i don't understand why their prices can be a little bit elevated on import lists and on at wholesale which imp inflates the prices wholesale which inflates the prices at the pet stores and i cannot figure out why that they're not one of the most popular fish in the hobby and why they're not half the price that they are typically sold at. Uh, but Bruce, you could probably find them. On, I thought Flip Aquatics had them at one point, but you can usually find them online. The other one too is the Empire Gudgeon. Now that one I haven't bred. Those are the ones we've gotten here. Uh, look up the Empire Gudgeon. That's a really, really pretty fish. Gets a little bit larger than the Peacock Gudgeon, but Oh my gosh, the colors on those are amazing too. But they don't necessarily show the color all the time, like I was saying earlier in the stream, uh, where the peacock cudgeons do. They're always showing color. Holy cow, everybody, I just realized the time. All right, we're going to wrap this bad boy up. You, you, you guys brought the questions tonight, so I'm really happy about that. Thank you for all the awesome questions and everything that you um, you brought with. Thank you to everybody, all the super chats and everything, and for all the new members that we've got going on. Moderators, as always, thank you so much for being here because you're the ones that hold down the fort. But it's pretty easy to do with this awesome group, at least in terms of monitoring all the, the stuff that's coming through. Um, thank you very much for being here. We are going to be back again next Wednesday, same time, same place. Uh, I think we do have a subject for next week that we'll be talking about, but definitely bring your questions. And if I didn't get a chance to answer them today, bring them, write them down, bring them for next Wednesday, and we'll try to get to them next week as well. So everybody have a good week and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.